Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Lydia Capital. So, uh, Matt, today I think we're out to generate some uh, Twitter controversy potentially today because we're gonna we're gonna delve into the area of dividends. And as you know, if anybody posts anything about dividends on Twitter, like it, a massive firestorm immediately erupts. So hopefully today we can uh, contribute to the firestorm ourselves here. Let's murder some sacred cash cows, shall we? <laughs> And it's, it's funny to me because, you know, dividends are, you know, we'll talk about what dividends are as we go through this, but dividends are something that investors probably love more than they love anything else. Like this idea of like money is deposited in my account. I mean, I don't know what it is. I'll ask you that, but the, it's just, people just love dividends and they become, you know, they, they get in groups of people who love dividends. They become like obsessed with dividends, like more so than anything else. Like if we were talking about value investing, sure. You'd have some people who support value investing, but it's not like that, like the people support dividends in a way that I've seen very few other things. So I, I guess my first question to you is, why do you think that is? I mean, why do people love dividends so much? I think there's there's a couple of different sides to the love for dividends. The first thing is we just love to get something back. So like I invest a bunch of money, I put a million dollars up for something. And just the idea that I'm getting some of it back, it's like a little acknowledgement that I'm doing something right. It's kind of like... Uh, you know, I, I like signed up for school and now I'm like getting the grades as they come in. It's just like a validating mechanism. It's feedback. If I invest in something that doesn't pay a dividend, like if I buy an empty parcel of land, for example, and there's nothing on it, it's very different than buying an apartment complex. And a big part of it is because if I buy something that doesn't produce a cash flow, I'm waiting for somebody else's indication of price or value or what it's worth or whatever. When I'm getting a dividend, I'm getting like, a dopamine hit of value. Just this indication that like, this is clearly worth something because look, 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 money, it happened. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the dopamine hit, kind of tying it to social media. But you know, you know the, the, the thing with me too is I think people love, you know, if I'm sitting here with you right now, we're having a podcast, like if money just gets put in my account, that's pretty cool. Like usually when, I, when money gets put in my account, I have to like work and then I work and they give me the money. Like, I think people like this idea that like they're just sitting there they're not doing anything and like money is just coming into their account. And, you know, we can talk later about why that might not be different than other ways that money comes into your account. But it, it is. I think people just love this idea that I just see these deposits coming in, you know, when I'm not doing anything for them. It's the ultimate culmination of the desire to I wasn't planning any music references, but this is dire straits, right? This is money for nothing, <laughs> like money for nothing and my dividends for free. That's basically what this comes down to here. <laughs> So it's, it's just this idea of like, it's the ultimate passive income. It's like, I already put up the money, which is an active decision, but then passively these dividends showing up, which just makes me, makes me feel good. And it's funny too, cause you see this on the company side too. Like there's certain lists companies can get on, like companies that have paid dividends for 20 years or companies that have grown their dividends for 20 years. And we'll, we'll talk about them later. But when a company's on that list or on one of these lists, like they will absolutely pay a dividend to their detriment. Like the business can be falling apart. Everything can be, you know, everything can be going crazy behind the scenes, but they still pay the dividend. And you see that as like a problem, like companies become obsessed with dividends or being known as like a dividend payer, just like individuals do. Which is a totally separate side for this. Maybe we get into this when we talk about the investment realities of it, but there's uh, in, in the finance literature, there's this whole like preferred habitat idea. And I do believe that there is a preferred habitat where somebody can say our shareholder base is people made up of people who are investors who want things like dividends. So we're going to serve that shareholder base to lock up our capital base for our company, a funding source based on people with these preferences, because then those dividend holders, like, why do you want to be on those lists? Well, guess who turns around and isn't like dumping your company stock. There's some control that comes there. And that's just good corporate strategy if that's your bag. You know, and the other thing is when you look at those long-term charts of the stock market and like the performance, you'll see all these charts that say, you know, X very large percentage of the return came from dividends. And so people tend to like associate, take that in the wrong way. So they tend to think because most of the returns come from dividends, if I buy the highest yielding stuff I possibly can, I'm going to get more of a percentage of my return from dividends and I'm going to push up my returns. But that's not the way it works. I mean, you're getting those dividends because you're investing in like a basket of companies but it doesn't mean that you're going to get like a bigger return just because a huge percentage of them come from dividends. 
it always makes me think of it's like, yeah, and most of this steak that I'm about to eat, it came from the milk I bought over the last like seven years at the grocery store. No, these are related but unrelated things that, yeah, people just combine unrightfully. How much do you see this with clients? Like when a client comes to you and wants a portfolio, how much do you see people saying, you know, I want dividends. I want dividends as part of my strategy. So in a planning perspective, and this goes everything, like if it's not obvious from this, everything we've done together on this education of a financial planner podcast, everything goes back to calendar, cash flow, balance sheet, CCBS, simple as that. So for people who on their calendar usually have some event, like you're retiring or you need to supplement income or something else, we're going, there's a cash flow problem for some period of time on the calendar. And once we have a cash flow problem, then we're looking at stuff on the balance sheet that can generate an income, interest, dividends, whatever it may be, to solve some cash flow deficit. So when people are coming looking for dividends or have a preference for dividends or whatever else, we always try to recontextualize it into what asset on your balance sheet needs to produce what cash flow that's net positive to you to meet what need on your calendar. So people come all the time thinking they want dividends, but if there's no shortfall in, in cash flow, and just another great example, it's like you can have people who hate paying taxes that love getting dividends. And you have to go, okay, but if you're getting a dividend, they're paying the tax. Like, which one do you hate more? How are we prioritizing this? And that becomes a thing to untangle. As planners, the perfectly logical solution, again, calendar cash flow balance sheet, reverse engineer, what do we need to do? What's the minimal amount of drag? And how do we engineer that? So people want it, but they don't always understand the prioritization of what or why they want this dividend thing. And that sort of gets into what we're going to talk about next, because you're, you're doing a good job, obviously, with clients of reframing, like, why do you actually want the dividends? And so that, that's kind of what I got into. I wrote an article a while back uh, called, I think, put down the dividends and slowly back away or something, which uh, I think because of the crazy, you know, clickbait title ended up being like my most Google picked it up or something. And it ended up being like my most read article I ever wrote. It's certainly not my best article, but uh, you got a lot of dividend <laughs> likes on that one. I'm sure. Dividend uh, yeah, comments. mostly yeah. generated controversy because, you know, obviously if I'd written pro dividend, I would have probably gotten more people supporting it. But uh, yeah, it's just a. Uh, when you reframe it, you start thinking about, all right, let's go through the specific reasons. Why do you want a dividend? And, and I think that's, I mean, maybe you can, we can kind of shift it to you to ask the questions here. But when we, when we do that, like, I think we come up with a different conclusion about dividends than maybe we do when we just think about dividends at a high level. Okay. So I, I think I'm going to go into this. If you need to step back one more level, step back one more level, but let's start. So underneath the, why do people want dividends? Feel free to go into that. But I think the first idea is this idea that like dividends beat the market. And if I just blanket throw out that statement, dividends beat the market, what say ye? Yeah, well, there's two things. First of all, it goes back to what we talked about before, which is this whole thing about a big portion of the market return comes from dividends. And so people you know, will associate that with, well, if a big part, part of the market returns comes from dividends, then by buying high yielding stocks, I'm going to beat the market. So there, there's two aspects to this though. You know, Dividends, first of all, what dividends really are, is they're a value metric. And so people have trouble, like they think about price to cash flow or price to earnings as a value metric, but they have trouble thinking about dividends as a value metric. But what is a value metric? A value metric is price divided by fundamental. I mean, that, that's basically what a price, what a, and, and a dividend yield is dividend divided by price. So this is a value metric, you know, as a price go, as a company gets cheaper, the yield is going to go up. And so this, this is a value metric. So when I'm thinking about beating the market with dividends, I am running a value strategy if I, if I use yield as my selecting criteria. And so then the question I have to ask myself is, what are the other ways I could run a value strategy and are they better than running a strategy using yield? And that's where dividends falls down. Yes, if you look long-term, if you buy, if you use dividend as a value metric, do you outperform the market? You do, but you don't outperform it by nearly as much as if you use some other metrics, price to cash flow, EV to EBITDA, a composite of value metrics. There's a lot of other things you can do where you get that outperformance, but you get more outperformance. And so that's the problem. It's not wrong to say that buying high yielding stocks outperforms the market over time, but it is wrong to say that's the best way to run a value strategy. This, this, the total return composition of this and the way you framed it, I think is so important. And one of the things it's hard for people to wrap their brains around and maybe just like to the extent you can paid out cash versus reinvested cash. Cause that's the company decision, right? 
The company is saying, should I be paying out this cash to shareholders or should I be reinvesting it? That's kind of like the two extremes of this. Can you just kind of like break down like the methodology from like total return that each of those things do? Because that kind of fits into like, well, the fundamentals and what you're trying to drive here to steer what's cheap and what's attractive and what's a, a, a landmine waiting to be stepped on. Yeah, well, first of all, at a high level, you know, think about capital allocation at a high level. When a company has money, they can do a bunch of things with their money. They can buy other companies, they can reinvest in their business, they can pay a dividend, and they can buy back shares as well. And so, you know, you want companies, you know, going back to what we said before, like a lot of companies will prefer dividends when maybe if looking at that framework independently, you wouldn't, the dividends wouldn't be the best choice. You know, maybe they have a better chance to invest back in their business. Maybe a buyback works better. You know, that's one thing. So, you know, people will, will prefer dividends. But uh, the other thing is this kind of gets into the idea of a dividend and a buyback, I think, to some degree. And, mm -hmm. you know, people love dividends and, you know, buybacks right now are like, you know, Congress is passing laws to, you know, to limit buybacks. So people hate buybacks and they love dividends. But when you think behind the scenes as to what each one is, as a shareholder, I'm getting my capital returned to me. It's just being so they're the same thing. It's just being done in a different way. You know, if, if it's a dividend, I'm getting money deposited in my account. If it's a buyback, I'm taking shares off the market. I own a bigger portion of the company. An equal amount of money put towards a dividend or a buyback, I should really be indifferent between those as an investor, obviously not considering taxes, which we'll talk about later, because the dividend is getting taxed and the buyback's not. Or I mean, I guess maybe they're going to tax companies on buybacks or something. But but that, that's a really important distinction to make is like, you might prefer dividends on the surface, but really behind the scenes, a dividend and a buyback are not that different of a thing. And this is why you use debt to refund, to finance your buyback, right? So you can write off that interest expense and then use that money. So inside of that, inside of this capital allocation decision that a company is making in the choice, leading up to the choice to pay the dividend, if you will, something we can't ignore is that just the ability to have excess cash to make a choice with is kind of an indication of quality. Right. So maybe you highlighted this a little bit in the paper, I think, too. The, the the link between dividends as a quality indicator, even if it's not exactly a quality factor. Yeah, and some people think it is a quality factor. But, you know, to me, this is the better place to use dividends. Like if I was building, and, you know, we don't use a ton of dividend strat criteria in our strategies. But if we did, like to me, this is where it would be best used. I, th I think it's better as a quality factor because going back to value, the problem with this high yielding thing is that, you know, you usually have a very, very high yield. Like you talk about those eight, 10% yields. Usually something has gone very wrong with the company. They don't get an eight to 10% yield because they're like, let's double the dividend payment. They get an eight right, to 10% right. yield because the stock price has been cut by half. And so what happens is typically when you get to that part, the dividend is actually at risk. Something has gone wrong in the business. So when the stock price has come down, but the dividend has not been adjusted yet, you have these eight or 10% yields, but they're not sustainable. The dividend cut is coming at some point in the future. And so that's a big problem with using it as a value factor is like a lot of those high yields are not really high. It's just a deceptive thing because the price has come down. The dividend hasn't come down yet. But go, going back to the quality thing, I, I think like dividend consistency, and you'll see a lot of ETFs out there that do this type of stuff, you know, whether they call them dividend achievers or dividend aristocrats, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, companies that have paid dividends for a certain amount of years or have consistently raised dividends for a certain amount of years. You know, we had Ryan Kruger on our other podcast and he, he runs a strategy like this. And, and I think that's the most sensible way to do it. I think it works. You know, again, it may not be the best quality factor, but I think it works well as a quality factor. And the other thing is, I, I think it works very well, like from a behavioral standpoint. And, you know, we may talk about this later, but the idea of yield on cost, I think with these quality dividend paying strategies, it works really well because what happens is these dividends grow over time and investors, you know, they invested whatever they invested at the beginning but the yield they're getting relative to their initial investment, you know, you can start out with a 3% yield, but for these guys that hold it for a really long time, I mean, you can be getting, you know, 10% plus even higher than that yields on cost. And so I think that's really, I think people love that behaviorally. They think, oh, I invested this money at the beginning. Now I'm getting this massive yield relative to my initial investment. Like I'm going to hold it longer. So I think it works from a quality standpoint better than value, but I also think it works from a behavioral standpoint for that reason. Now I kind of want to launch like a deadbeat dividends index where we just track all like the cutters and the people who just burn their shareholders' bases and they feel jaded against. Uh, I, I want to ask about this too, and I didn't prep you for this one. I'm just asking this blind, but it just makes me think about it. I think when thinking about dividends as quality, especially because we've lived in this zero interest per rate world for so long. And I kind of joked about this a minute ago that companies will issue debt to then fund buybacks or, or 
pay dividends. We actually saw that a lot in the last 10 plus years. How important is it if you're going to use dividend as quality to not just look at market cap and look at things like enterprise value that take the entire balance sheet into consideration before you can even understand, like, can the company even afford to pay this money out to our shareholders? Yeah, no, I think that's definitely true. And I think it's definitely important to look behind the scenes and say, like, I mean, obviously, the fact that you've paid a dividend consistently for 20 years or raised it for 20 years, you know, is some sort of an indication that you probably what's going on behind the scenes leads you to be able to continue to pay a dividend. But you're, you're right. I mean, you definitely want to look behind the scenes more. And, you know, there's quantitative ways you can do this or, or also like a lot of guys in the dividend space will be qualitative guys and they really will, will dig deep into these businesses and try to understand what's going on. So, yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. And, and the other thing you, you said about, you know, buybacks, I think I think we should add a little bit to what we said before about buybacks because yeah, go ahead. buybacks are so controversial right now, but it's not, it's never the thing. It's always how the thing is used. And that's true of everything in investing. That's true of dividends. It's true of buybacks. So people hate buybacks, but what a buyback is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a buyback. It's how you execute a buyback that can be the problem. And so the biggest thing you see right now is you'll, and you'll see it a lot with tech companies is what they're doing is they're issuing shares to employees. And then that's the, getting washed by the company buying back the shares. So as a shareholder, I'm not getting any benefit of that buyback. What they're doing is they're masking their behavior, you know, what they're doing with their executives by buying back the stock. So that's bad. And that's what people see in the media. And that's why people hate buybacks. But a company that when their stock is cheap, they accelerate their buybacks. And then when their stock is expensive, they don't buy it back. I mean, that's a huge benefit to me as a shareholder. And so it's really important not to get wrapped up in political people and, you know, people in, in our space saying good, bad buyback, good, bad dividend. It's important to say what is actually going on behind the scenes, because for the most part, none of these things are a bad thing on their own. It's how you use them that becomes the bad thing. 100%. How you use them, how the companies are using them, and then just understanding it over history. Uh, I'm thinking about like some of the companies that we've seen where we've had either dividend cuts or I'm going to say like dividend drama in the last like 10, 20 years. You had some stalwart companies that made big dividend decisions. Um GE, Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to think, did Disney or one of them did it too? Like you have companies that have suspended or altered dividend policies. And what's really interesting is if you look back up against the buybacks, if you looked back against the debt issuance, if you looked back against the dividend policies and free cash flow, you start to understand where are the places that these dividends are originating from. And then how did the company change over time? Because that'll tell you the actual story. You could probably bet on it in a basket of ETFs, like inside of an ETF, a basket of stocks. But it, but it does get, but it does get tricky. My kids are yelling at me. Yeah, it comes out of food. They figured out. So, where's our dividends, Dad? Where's our dividends? Well, this is funny because so they figured out how to use the Alexa um, to effectively like eavesdrop on my podcast and yell at me. Uh, So this is this is obviously a very positive thing. They can take the one in the kitchen now and they can actually yell back at me um, while I'm doing this. And let us just remind Amazon shareholders, as part of the non-dividend paying policy of the company, it's enabled things like Alexa to grow and be in your home and interrupt this very podcast. But to your point on dividends, you know, that's a really, what you said is really, really important because for all these people that are the huge dividend lovers, they see like a cut in the dividend is a huge problem. You know, if you're one of these 20 year dividend payers and you cut your dividend, that's a disaster. That shows a sign that there's something wrong with the business. And the reality is a lot of times it's the opposite of that. Like a good company with good management, you know, we get something, Mm -hmm. some sort of comes out of left field. We get the 2008 crisis or something. Like as an investor, I want them to cut their dividend. Like of the other things they could be doing, investing back in their business, you know, whatever that is, you know, the odds are there's probably other things they should be doing right now in in a financial catastrophe than sitting there worrying about their dividend payment. So, you know, it's, it's hard for people who are dividend fans to wrap their arms around that. But there are absolutely situations where a company that's paid dividends for a really long time should cut the dividend temporarily. To, to deal with what's going on in their business. I just, I pulled it up because it was driving me crazy. 2020, 20, or 2020, 2020, 2020, the Tony, Tony, Tony of 2020s. Uh, the dividend was suspended at Disney to conserve cash and ensure the company's survival. As of August, 2021, all their theme parks opened again and other businesses came back online, which made investors at the time believe that they could reinstate the dividend. So to your point, like, It's just a lever of corporate management. And the nice part about a shareholder dividend versus like a debt payment or something else is it might be sustained. Uh, It can be suspended. It can, unlike 
unlike preferred securities and other instruments, it can be cumulative or non-cumulative. There's all these different factors that go in. And to the dividend people who can't read financial statements, like these are the nuances that really matter. And, and especially if you're doing like what you're doing and doing clustered analysis of a basket. Yeah, and it's, it's true. You know, we've kind of, we're in this like black and white world these days. And it's true, obviously, the high level in politics, but it's also true in investing. And like, you know, the people with dividends tend to get trapped in this black and white world of like dividends are the greatest thing in the world. And, and you know, that's just the way, just being able to take a step back and look at the facts and say, you know, it's not always good or it's not always bad. Like you, you need to be able to look behind the scenes and look at the circumstances of that specific case and say, you know, what is the right decision regarding a dividend? And, you know, the really good company management, that's exactly what they do. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not all just Modigliani and Miller or whatever other crazy formulas come into deciding this stuff, right? So I want to ask you about this, this last point I had, I want to ask you about it because I think, you know, you, you might know more about this than me, but you know, one of the things I put in my article is people feel like, especially if they have an equity portfolio and they're not getting income from bonds or something like that, they feel like if I'm withdrawing money, I need a way to get that money and dividends just put the money in the account. So that's the best way to do it. And you know, when you look behind the scenes, like someone like me, like me would, you say, all right, I can do that in a different way. Like, I don't need necessarily to ha have dividends to fund my withdrawals. I can use what, what people would call a synthetic dividend. I can intelligently sell things I own and I can generate the cash and I can use that to fund my withdrawals. So I'm just wondering, like, do you think about that idea at all of like a synthetic dividend and, you know, how that would could be used to fund withdrawals? Okay, so let's let's just like walk through this structurally for a second because this is a conversation we have all the time. And we'll connect it back because I want to make sure we hit a, po a component of this of talking to people who like own businesses or have unique assets because that's a whole subspecialty of what we do every day. So first off, we're looking at the balance sheet. Like you said, in this case, you have a basket of stocks. You have a stock portfolio already and we're trying to get cash flow from that thing. So anytime I have an asset, and I'm trying to figure out how to get cash flow from it. I'm always thinking about a net version of that cash flow because what happens when you introduce a cash flow? Most times you have some type of income. What's that magical T word that you have to pay, Jack? Now that would be taxes, Matt. Taxes are coming into the equation. So on a taxable portfolio of dividend paying stocks, one reason to like dividends is generally speaking, stock dividends are going to get paid at the long-term capital gains rate. And that's attractive because it means if I own a company and they're spinning off a dividend, that long-term capital gains rate is probably less than my ordinary income rate, especially if I'm still working or whatever else. So right off the top, one attractive part about dividends is usually a lower tax rate, meaning the amount of tax taken out of what I'll owe for that income being received than I would get from my ordinary income, going to work or doing whatever else. That's an advantage over many types of bonds. That's an advantage over many other types of things. A CD or a money market that, oh, by the way, we're all excited about those rates. You're paying ordinary income on those. Don't forget that. That's a really important detail. So anytime you're converting an asset into a cash flow, you have to think about what tax frictions am I introducing into that income stream? Now, on top of that, that also means one of the most, the, the, the single most important things you could do is always think in terms of like tax equivalent yield, because it might be a factor of, do I really want this income to come from a dividend from a stock? Do I want it to come from income from municipal bond? What if it's only federal tax exempt and not state tax exempt? How does that play into my entire income picture? Do I want to receive it from an alternative? Are there different ways that different fund structures can give me other tax breaks that work out for my unique situation? There's no broad brush stroke. There's the general truth that dividends are taxed at a lower rate than ordinary income. But until you combine that whole cash flow statement, you cannot adequately answer that question or make this point. And that is a huge deal. Yeah, no, the, the tax thing you mentioned is, is really huge. And, you know, you, what you're referencing is qualified dividends, which is, I believe the rule is if you've held them for 60, the stock for 60 out of the past 90 days, it's a qualified dividend. Don't, don't take tax advice from me, you know, look it up online. But that's the idea is like, in most cases, if you've held the stock for a reasonable amount of time, the dividend is going to be taxed at a lower rate. And then when you get on the capital gains, it's really important to think about that because I've kind of got, if, if I'm going to do a synthetic dividend, I've got three ways I can do it. I can sell short-term gains. I can sell long-term gains. I can sell losses. And my ability, how those blend together in terms of what I'm selling plays a big role in terms of how's the taxation of that going to look relative to the dividend. So I think that's really important for people to think of. And, you know, it can be better 
you know, if you're, if you're selling losses and, you know, some combination of losses and long-term gains or something, it can actually have better tax treatment than the dividend. If you're selling short-term gains, it's way, way worse tax treatment than the dividend. So it is a little more complicated than the dividend just being put in your pocket. And let's define that term because I, I lovingly jumped over it. Synthetic dividend is this concept that I'm taking something on my balance sheet that doesn't pay a dividend or I need a little bit more from it maybe. So I've got a growth stock and it doesn't pay any dividend. Well, once I've held it for a year, once I've achieved a long-term capital gain, and that's the reason I invoked this idea of paying the lower income tax, short-term capital gains traditionally tax at your income, your ordinary income tax level. The long-term capital gains, same tax rate as dividends. So if I have a bunch of growth stocks that pay no yield, but I wanna clip 3% out of that portfolio, well, so long as they're long-term capital gains, I can basically create a synthetic dividend to myself, have the same tax treatment, but have a balance sheet asset, a portfolio that's com comprised of things that aren't my traditional dividend stocks. This thinking, this math, knowing qualified, non-qualified, tax equivalent yield, all these details are critical if you're trying to intelligently figure out how much in my cash flow is money that I actually get to spend towards consumption or keep. I mean, unless you love paying taxes, you probably want to think about this stuff. And you know, the other point you made earlier, which is important to keep in mind, is that we're not talking about retirement accounts here. Obviously, in a retirement account, where the income comes from, no one cares. Um, you know, in terms of tax, there's no taxation. So the dividend, it could be a dividend, it could be short-term held positions, it could be long-term held positions. So it's, it's a different situation. You know, in a if you're pulling money out of an IRA, you know, you're, you're getting taxed when you pull the money. You know, where, how you're getting it is, is not, the taxes don't, don't play as big a role there or any role. Yeah. And you have to think about that too, because it's like, oh, I'm getting my, I'm getting all these dividends from these high dividend stocks or funds or whatever inside of my retirement account. It's like, okay, great. But when your retirement account takes the distribution, your traditional uh, deferred tax deferred retirement account, you make that distribution, your distribution's ordinary income. So take advantage of a factor if you're using the dividend as a return driving factor inside the composition of that portfolio, but appreciate the actual ramifications of taking a distribution from that account. Is there anything else we missed in terms of how you think about, you know, as a planner, when you're planning for people's future, is there anything else you think about with dividends that we've, that we've missed or have we kind of covered all of it? So, so something I love and where we see the logic kind of like click the light bulb moment more than anything else. And it, introduces some other fun wrinkles too, but business owners typically have a better understanding of what this means once we start talking about it. And I think non-business owners can learn a lot from just adding this thinking to the mix. Because the idea is when you think about that portfolio asset, whether it's a stock you own, or you own a bunch of income producing rental properties, or you own a business, whatever those unique assets are that you have on your balance sheet and you think about how they spin off money, that can give you insight to these policies because we'll use like, if you're a business owner and you have a bunch of rental units, for example, you already know how these rental units pay you income. And so the logic that goes on to analyzing a dividend is a lot like the logic where you say, would you just take all the money out of your rental income and just immediately go spend it on something? Or like once in a while, do you have to replace a toilet or whatever else or need something in the emergency fund? And just being able to apply that logic to a strategy really, I think, helps you crack the code, the logic, the way you want to think about it in the context of your broader portfolio. So you can understand, like, when do I want something to pay out a distribution as a dividend to me versus when do I want it to keep it? And let's not forget the dividend is just a tool. It's a tool for the corporation or the board or the fund or whatever it is. And it's a tool for us as investors to make sure it's doing the thing we want to do with it. I never want to be trying to hammer in a nail with the back end of a Phillips head screwdriver. That's stupid. Use a hammer for that. <laughs> so I think that's a great way to wrap up. Um, I mean, do you think we've done anything here to change uh, people's obsessions with dividends or you think we, uh, you think that's probably going to continue? I think the obsession is going to continue. What I hope we're doing here and why I was excited to have this conversation with you is it's, we have to be able to talk about these things and talking about them is to actually untangle the logic, not so you can go out and recite a textbook on dividend theory, history, and blah, blah, blah. The point is like, you have to think about why you own what you own 
and then how to use it. And that's where professional investors, advisors, planners, allocators like us come into play. And it's also where if people come to the table with a little more of the understanding around why dividends are even a thing, then we can have a much more fruitful conversation about, okay, well, now let's get to what really matters. How do we make the thing work for you? And I think that's a great way to wrap up. I'll put, I'll put a link to my over-the-top clickbait article um, in, in the notes here so people know who to attack when they're ready to go after uh, someone who's come after dividends. So uh, I'll put that in there and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.